So the next uh, topic we were going to talk about is what types of research questions and topics are most suitable to online or phone surveys. Um, so some of this does depend on if it's an online or phone survey, but I think in general, um, because uh, you're not, you know, having people go face to face, um, first off, you should really think about topics or areas that you already know very well. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to have been in the country studying this for many, many years, but like we were talking about earlier, if you can't go there to gather this intel on the ground that uh, usually I would um, highly recommend you do before you uh, do undertake this sort of research, um, you can then try your best to uh, read everything that's out there, uh, talk to experts, uh, set up online interviews with people from the region, etc. Um, and so that's the part about do the additional research. Don't just hop over that step, I guess, is what I'm trying to emphasize here. Um, it, if you can avoid sensitive questions, then uh, I think that, I think in general, um, in general, that's a good idea in surveys, but uh, in particular with um, online or phone surveys, as Mazen was saying, you have this lack of knowledge of the participants' surroundings. So when you're working with a survey firm on the ground and you're going face to face, you do trainings. And in that training, it should be very important then um, to emphasize that the participant should be, you know, alone and in a comfortable uh, area in order to speak to you. Um, so one thing, for example, about, um, you know, calling into uh, refugees in, in camps is that, uh, for example, you have no idea what their sit living situation is. And so they may not have walls around their house. And that means, therefore, that anyone who is close to the, you know, sort of flap of the tent can listen in and hear what that person's saying. Um, and so it just gets, it gets really difficult with this lack of knowledge of, of um, where your participant is and who can listen in, um, and particularly with sensitive questions then, because some things, if you get people to say them, could get them into trouble if other people hear. Um, so it's not just about like that you're going to introduce bias into your own survey, you could actually be getting the person into trouble. Um, and then this lack of ability to establish a rapport with the participants. So we talked about also how um, both phone and online surveys need to be shorter, and that gives you even less time to then build in questions that sort of maybe warm the subject up or you know warm the participant up to um, to speaking to you and uh, giving you their information. And also, since there's not this sort of face-to-face -face rapport, you know, um, like Michael said in. in in the when you have um, surveyors knocking on people's doors and there's sort of this um, hospitality kicks in and politeness kicks in um, and you're welcoming this person into your home and so that sort of establishes this different relationship than you get with something like a Facebook survey or a phone survey. Um, we already talked about shorter questionnaires, uh, also shorter questions, <laughs> and that ties in with the simpler experiments. So some experiments, especially these um, uh, ones that I tend to specialize in, which are conjoint experiments, they can get very lengthy. Uh, sometimes there are up to nine arms, usually you don't want to go over that. Um, but still, that's nine factors randomizing in and out, and then especially if it's a vignette, um, which we often use to sort of um, situate those randomized components into um, a story that maybe makes more sense um, or contextualizes what the experiment's about. Uh, but the problem is that you have to remember when people, especially if they're listening to it on the phone, how much information uh, do you think that you would be able to recall, right, if somebody's talking to you over the phone? And especially if, um, you know, the phone might be not the best quality uh, or sound quality all of the time, et cetera. Um, maybe there is this advantage for list experiments, we could say. That's something to think about. I've never done a study on that, but um, you know, list experiments involve uh, asking a person, you're, you're trying to make it so that it's, the person can answer anonymously. And uh, what it usually involves is that you ask a question like, which of these have you done before in the past? And then it's a list of items and one of the items will be sensitive. But the whole trick to it is you want the person to tell you only how many items they have done in the past and not which items because you're trying to give them a way to not reveal that sensitive 
behavior. Uh, the problem is a lot of people will sit there and be like, ah, oh, yes, uh-huh, done that one, uh, that one, two, yeah, three, you know, and then they are obviously revealing it. Uh, so there's lots of uh, tricks that surveyors try to use to get around this. Uh, for example, we have, um, we have them turn their back maybe, or um, we have the, the person can hide sort of their hand under the table or something like this. But, um, but obviously if you're doing this on like Facebook and uh, there's not a person seeing them or, or on the phone, maybe it could work if you say count up on your fingers, but do not verbalize. Uh, so that could work. Um, I've already discussed the disadvantage for conjoints though. Uh, targeted populations are, or uh, sometimes hard to reach populations. So that actually gets into what I said earlier about if there's uh, sort of some sort of um, group that you know that all has like a, um, you know, they all go to a, a single Facebook page or they're all connected to the same Facebook page. So for example, maybe uh, if you wanted to run a study about a specific tribe or specific tribes, and those big tribes have, um, some of them have these Facebook pages where they have, uh, everyone in the tribe is sort of connected to the same Facebook page. So that might be one way to get a really cool sort of sampling design that you wouldn't be able to get um, um, through anywhere else except for maybe Facebook. <laughs> um, or also hard to reach populations, but again, there come some caveats with uh, reaching sensitive populations. Uh, so, for example, I've also heard of people calling into prisons, and again, um, we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, later, but um, uh, thinking through like who can hear and if that prisoner actually has, um, is, you know, feels like they're able to say no, and then also um, uh, ensuring that they're not, you know, going to be put in harm's way from somebody hearing uh, the answers. Um, and questions that do not require knowledge of contextual factors. So often uh, you can ask people perceptions in surveys, but if you want, um, we also often use surveys to get information about the context. So a good example would be like ethno-linguistic factualization indices, right? So if you want to have a measure of ethnic diversity in the area, then more and more people are turning to surveys that um, collect people's ethnicity but then you need to sort of also be able to put that into a geographic area. And since uh, phone, um, phones in particular, you can't, um, you can't actually know where the person is. You, you, and in the Middle East, you know, people don't have really well-defined addresses often, so you're not gonna be able to do it that way either. Plus that would violate anonymity in many ways. So, um, so think that through then. If something like ethnic diversity is gonna be a big factor for answering your question, maybe not your, independent variable, but a control variable that you would need to have, you're not going to be able to do that with this type of uh, format. Okay, yeah, thank you, Kristen. Well, um, um, there was just a, a very quick remark that I wanted to make, which is, I think there was a question that was asked in the, before the break and the, we, we more or less didn't manage to answer it, which is about the cost. So very quickly, I'm, I'm just going to answer it uh, pertaining to Egypt. So if you're looking about the field survey in Egypt for uh, a sample of 2000 respondents, then this is somewhere between um, $100,000 to $120,000. There are cheaper survey organizations and there are more expensive survey organizations. Uh, but that's the, more or less the, the average. And if it is a phone survey, then it is uh, usually, it, as I've said, 80% cheaper. So we're talking about $20,000, $25,000, um, something like this. But that's only Egypt. And that's Egypt, maybe uh, 2020. I'm not sure about Egypt 2021 or maybe the other countries. Uh, but back to the, to the topic. Can I for a second, Mazen? Sorry. Just oh, yeah. On that. Go ahead. The most expensive survey you can do is one that you get terrible data from that you've already paid out for because then you have a cost per interview that's essentially infinite. So it is important to think about the cost per survey, but if someone's quoting you something that's impossibly low, that's a really bad sign. Even if they say they can do it, you're probably going to end up paying more for essentially ending up with no data at the end. So there's a lot of us, I think Kristen, Maz, and I would always be happy to talk to you to think about what the prices typically would be, but don't just go with the cheapest 
uh, bargain price would be my recommendation. Yes, um, I strongly support this. Uh, so uh, basically types of questions um, pertaining to phone surveys. Um, so um, I had three points basically. One of them, sorry about this, is that, um, well, you only have around 20 to 25 questions. Um, and um, usually, as we know, respondents get to get less attentive towards the end because they're tired and they just want to finish the phone call. Um, so there is sort of a trade-off, okay? Um, usually, uh, the very interesting dependent variables in a traditional survey or a traditional questionnaire um, are at the end, uh, but you do not want to delay them or to postpone them till the very, very end because this is where attention really decreases significantly. So you usually somehow have to put demographics at the beginning because this is phone and they want to establish rapport. If you uh, ask the first question, how far do you like the president, people will not answer. Uh, so uh, um, um, you really have to make this trade-off, which is quite difficult between having three or four questions, um, demographic questions, establishing trust, um, and uh, at the same time, not um, having your most important questions at the end, especially if it is an experiment, um, and the DBs usually come at the end with the questions uh, tracing the causal pathway. Um, so always um, be attentive to this. Um, and I've said I myself have been a subject of uh, an elite um, um, survey recently, and the phone over the phone and the phone interview lasted for around 25 minutes. I was really, really tired towards the end. Uh, I do not want to imagine that this has been the feeling of the respondents in my own surveys. Uh, but um, yeah, elite, uh, elite surveys are different from mass surveys. So maybe my, my interview was that long because it was an elite survey. Um, I usually follow um, this more or less trick um, which is introducing some questions with the sole purpose of checking whether the respondents feel comfortable or not in answering um, the survey. So same or semi-sensitive questions, for example, how far do you trust the government? If you get really significantly high trust levels compared with what you know from previous field surveys, then this is probably indicated that, well, people are not really honest, not only pertaining to this question, but maybe pertaining to other questions. Uh, but if you get more or less um, 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 a percentage along the same patterns that you know, this is usually one way of me trying to convince the viewers that even though it's a phone survey, uh, people are more or less are not really falsifying preferences. And the proof is that their level of distrust in government um, is um, um, the usual one that we see in field surveys. Uh, 